Welcome everyone to this week's episode of Event Icons Live from PCMA Convening Leaders. I'm Lindsay and joining today with me I've got Brant. Hello. As well as Angie and Peter and we're going to talk a little bit about running events and fun entertainment in San Francisco and you know shed all the cool details about PCMA too. It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons. Presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Just go to www.event-icons.com to ask questions. Our iconic guests will answer them live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better the conversation. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons. All right. Well, now that we're here, it's funny, too, because we have a San Francisco native, and then we have someone who's almost a lifer at the PC May events. We were discussing it. You've been four times, six times? About six times, yeah. And then Brant's a first-timer. And this is my 10th PCMA. So I feel like together, there's lots of really good stuff to talk about. So Angie, Peter, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves? And if you weren't doing events and entertainment for a living, what, should we be, what would you be doing and why? Go ahead. Well, I've been doing... Uh, events well entertainment for events pretty much all my life um but i guess my education was in broadcasting so i would probably be in some somehow related to broadcasting um just because that was what i originally wanted to do i don't really have any other reason i've been doing this so long so behind the camera on broadcasting or in front of it in a radio booth oh oh that kind of broadcasting oh There's a terrible joke there. I won't make it because that's because I have a face for radio. Is that what you want to tell me? It's okay. Thank you. All right, we're done. Thanks, everybody. It's been great. <laughs> we'll see you next time. On- <laughs> Save me, Angie. Take Save two. Me. Well, I'm not in a radio booth. Um, so I've been doing this since same thing. Graduated from college and kind of fell into it. I think if my parents asked me what I would be doing, I would be doing something in my major, which was criminal psychology and forensic sociology. Um, So I'd probably be working for the FBI, but in reality, I I think something travel-oriented would probably be what what I'd be doing, because it's my passion, it's what I love, and go ahead. What about a traveling criminal psychologist? Yes, huh? all of that. Yeah. That's scary. All of that. I don't know what that means, no. but I'm all about that. Sounds good, though, doesn't it? Yeah. All just right. getting, Can you imagine, like, blue uh, planes? You could be on 60 mm-hmm. Minutes, probably. Yes. It definitely sounds like a series. It would be like, you know, d- d- amazing destinations, like this week we're in Hawaii. I have a new be job. Like CSI Finding all these messed up people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thinking about travel and destinations. <laughs> Great. We'll open us all back. So... Let's talk a little bit about what it would be like to run an event for event planners in one of the most, I think, unique cities in in the country. Like to me, San Francisco is always fascinating because Moscone, which is the convention center here, has gone through this great renovation and it's absolutely massive. And then when you think about the different hotels and just all the other really cool venues that the city has, I, I just, I'm like, oh, how do you even choose for the happy hours and the parties and just the different things? And how did they fix the Wi-Fi problem inside Moscone? Because it's amazing now and it used to suck terribly. So way to go, renovation team. So what's your favorite venue to run an event here in town and why? Well, as far as I'm concerned, there's a lot of great venues. I don't think there's any one that's my favorite. I mean, it depends on the size of the venue. You know, we've got City Hall, which is the grand dame of the city, which is wonderful to do events in. Um, it's classy, it's high end, and for the right crowd, which can be anything from 200 to 3,000 people, right. it's just a wonderful event, event space. Um, but we've got spaces like Pier 48, AT&T Park, Palace of Fine Arts. We've got a lot of different spaces, and it really just depends you know, on what your crowd is and what you want. Because we have a lot of younger people that come here, a lot of Silicon Valley ev- you know, related mm-hmm. events. Um, they're usually bigger spaces that we're involved in and that the people um, really want to have space to, whether it's doing a concert, just networking, dancing, 
quiet dinners. You know, it seems they want places that are good raw space that's really cool and that you, that you have kind of a clean slate to start from. I love that raw space. I've never thought of it like that, but it really is but that's moldable what it clay. Is. Yeah. yeah. Like Excellent lighting. I have to agree with you. Going into cities and looking for large venues was always a challenge for citywide conferences like that. And San Francisco has a lot of them. Yeah. And so you're not. I feel like sometimes when you go to a city and you have 4,000 people, you're going to the same venue mm -hmm. over and over and you're trying to rethink the space, whether or not it's open and raw, whatever it is, it's still the same venue. But here you have a couple of different unique ones that you could really, depending the size, that are flexible. So I think PCMA did a great job on opening night when they went to the pier. They reimagined that space based on other industry events that have been here a little bit mm -hmm. and used two buildings instead of one. Like they spread it out a little bit. So it was nice to see them use it differently. Being that I wasn't there, which uh, pier? 28. 28. 28. Oh, the, cr the cruise ship? 48. Oh, it was 48 by oh, okay. AT&T Park. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's a great so venue. so many numbers that night. Well, so you I know where the Cirque du Soleil now. event yeah. is going on? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, right that behind yeah. that and Shed A and Shed yeah, B. And I liked how they chose to do different almost cultural because it was the almost the Cirque du, Soleil, whoop, whoop, Cirque du Soleil installation there and then like wine country and dancing over in the other shed yeah and I beeline for Chinatown I was yes, like where the sushi dumplings was at? so the food has yeah. been amazing they did a really year. really good job with it I feel like and maybe this is I mean this could just be my perception um, but it feels like a lot of the push for those experiences those unique venues has kind of come from this area I don't know if that's accurate at all, um, but it does. It just feels like so. As to hear you talk about that, you know, using kind of raw spaces and things like that. Is there is there more of an emphasis on that here in this neck of the woods uh, compared to the rest of the country? Were they doing it first, or am I just making that all up? We did everything <laughs> first. <laughs> Why did I even bother to ask the question? Of course, you didn't need to. No. I don't. I don't know that there's a, an emphasis here on raw space. I think it's just availability of what we've got in the area. Um, you know, because we're on the water, we've got a lot of piers. Um, the Exploratorium that used to be at the Palace of Fine yes. Arts, which is a building that was built for the 1906 World's Fair, I think, mm -hmm. something like that. You know, here's this gorgeous building that the Exploratorium outgrew. They moved to a pier. Now we have two venues to use, the Palace of Fine Arts being a wonderful event uh, venue and the Exploratorium, which is, you know, a great museum slash venue. Yeah. Um, I think it's just part of the geography of the city being on the water, being as old as it is, um, you know, which I guess relative to other places around the world is not that old, but, you know, it's just the, the way it's been built and the architecture that we've uh, been fortunate to have, not to mention all the corporate headquarters that are here that make use of these facilities that make it possible to have a lot of them. And I think maybe that's where it is, Brant, like the challenge that's coming from the corporate event planners and the marketers that live inside a lot of these major, especially software corporations, because the user conferences for tech conferences, they were kind of bland until they were like, listen, we're going to have some flair. And I really, that's a trend that's spread throughout, and it's been fun to watch. And I think that we do have to give you and your city that credit. Grudgingly, oh, but there it is. <laughs> well, and probably the same along the same lines. The draw of, of younger workforce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we've frequently talked about as much as I hate generalizations. The idea that millennials are kind of driving the experiential events. Yeah. Um, when we're obviously we all benefit from experiential events, but you know, if you take that as read that you know that that that's a fact, then having that younger workforce, having that tech-based workforce, is definitely going to flow into that. That idea of you know, making it more of an experience and a thing as opposed to just, it's a hotel ballroom and we've got some shrimp. <laughs> See, at least you didn't go for the chicken. The yeah. chicken's usually there. So Angie, knowing that you've gone to a few PCMAs and now we're here in San, like, I really feel like PCMA has almost rediscovered themselves in certain ways. What's been your favorite thing so far? Great question. I did not go last year, so I do not know what PCMA did. Was, were you there? No, you weren't. Were you at last year's? Not last okay. year's. So but we don't really know what they did last year, right? <laughs> um, but I think from the year prior to that, they definitely broke up their spaces more. They yeah. have they utilize different spaces in the area. Now I do have to say when they were in Nashville, it was so scattered. It yes. was hard to find yeah. things, right? And that Gaylord is so 
interesting anyways because they're like here's carpet if you're in the right shade of carpet you're in the right place and i'm like but there's four there's four squares of carpet in one place help me gaylord i need help yeah and that was the one i was at was the one at the convention center yeah so they like you were going up a ramp and all of a sudden you were in a new destination you were gonna it was it was confusing um here i'm discovering they're doing the same thing they're utilizing all the spaces um, I do wish signage was a little bit better yeah. so I could find the locations. But even today, you know, we're not to your session. You were kind of in the bowels of the building. And I was like, oh, I didn't even know this was up here. And there were some activations up there that I was like, I hope people can find them. But I do like the use of space yeah. because it is a great renovation. And they needed to show the space and show that it was very movable. Things have been really easy to get to. Yeah. And I think the division of how they did their education made sense. I asked someone last night, okay, what do I need to see? And I still haven't had a chance to do it because it's been so crazy today. But, um, and, or, you know, what do I need to do? What do I need to see? And she said, just wander. Like the biggest thing is to just wander and that you're going to come around a corner and you're going to find something you didn't expect. And you're just, so I think there's, that's an interesting aspect of, uh, of, of the experience, right? Is that oh, there's just going to be surprises around every corner. And so when that's the struggle though, is that if you have to have good signage to find where you're going, but at the same time, like you say, there's this whole area you didn't even know existed, yeah. right. uh, you know, around the corner. So how do you balance that? And this is a general question for, for either one of you, but finding that balance in the design of the event between, you know, here's, here's, here's the mystery, but also we need to get people to the right spot and to the right place at the right time. I mean, I would say it's their volunteers. You know, Visit California and just the entire, all of the CVBs and the chapter, the PCMA North California chapter has been just absolutely rock star. But, you know, starting, we're staying at an Airbnb in Nob Hill and starting at the top of where we are by the Ritz are volunteers out there in the cold with the earmuffs and like really visible signs. And it just keeps going until you get there and everyone knows the answers to the questions. Mm -hmm. It does not matter who you talk to. And that's really unique because we go to a lot of events where the volunteers are like we don't know mm -hmm. but it was well trained and they've got so where the signage maybe there's a gap the human element more than makes up for it and they dress them for that yes. those bright orange jackets are spot on for human directionals if you need someone you can find it but i don't see them as scattered in those tucked away areas though True. so that could be another opportunity yeah. for growth but i think they're making really good use of the space that's why i see differently yeah mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about entertainment, Peter, for a second, because for a group of event planners, you, you've got a really crazy background. He was sharing earlier before we came on the air that we discovered these two both have in common as event professionals, they've both worked a funeral. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Crazy world. Just pretty rare. But you don't really want to be talking about that. No, I you. don't. But I was just like, there was like, I felt like we should have a moment of silence. Like the Southerner is like, bless your heart. Um, <laughs> but, you know, thinking about designing events for people who put on events, what would you say would be the kind of entertainment you'd like to see on stages that maybe isn't happening right now? Oh, man. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't, I can't say... I really can't answer that question, to be honest with you, um, because we do so many kinds of entertainment. You know, whether it's, you know, like for our company, whether it's our speakers department that's putting a, uh, a speaker up there who's going to speak about some bizarre, outlandish idea, which we get those challenges right. um, from our clients, or it's a custom entertainment piece that we s do from scratch that we brainstorm with the client and you know, work with them and work with their team to come up with something. Um, you know, our clients are pretty diverse from the Silicon Valley people to clothing companies to, you know, uh, uh, I mean, it's just every type of thing. So we're challenged um, with doing different things. But so as far as putting something up there that I feel should be up there that I haven't seen, I, I really don't, I couldn't answer that question. I think that, you know, we, the way we take the attitude is, the entertainment fits into the event. The event is not built around the entertainment. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, if we're doing a headliner, for example, the concert is a part of the party. The party is not a part of the concert. Because like anything, you know, the party begins, and it's kind of like a three-act three, three act play. You know, the beginning's all about food and beverage. And yeah, you got entertainment going on, and you want it to be creative and different. You don't want to just have the same old boring, you know, jazz trio or whatever it is in the beginning. We, you know. 
we come from, we want to be unique, we want to be different, we want to be creative. Um, and we create a lot of our own entertainment. Um, and then the second part is the kind of the featured piece of the night, if it's a concert, if it's like tonight, Maroon 5. And after that, it's dancing, it's partying, it's let's end the night for the next hour, hour and a half, right. and just have a lot of fun. But we like to be creative in the way we do that. And so it's not just background music, concert, DJ. You know, it's taking them on a journey, kind of what you said about walking through the, the, the event. You know, we go through it and we try to, you know, oh, wait a minute, what was that? You know, and what, what was this? And, you know, even with when, you know, the other side of our company, which represents talent, the talent we represent, we try to have unique things. Right. So, you know, the show Beach Blanket Babylon, which was here for so many years that just closed on December 31st, was all about creativity and bizarre hats and bizarre, you know, uh, material, and they were always up on current events, and that's what we try to do is try to stay ahead of the curve. And so as far as entertainment goes and entertainment producers and creating something for the event, our job is to bring you something that you're just not going to, you know, if you need a piano player, go hire a piano player, I'll give you a phone number. You know, you don't, you don't need me for that, Yeah. you know. And so our jobs stay ahead of the curve and do stuff that you're not necessarily going to think of. You know, kind of designing the entertainment uh, portion of the event is like does being an event planner and designing the whole event. We work with the event planner yeah. to go through that journey together. Yeah, I like that, though, because it really does mean that, like, the education we're getting at this event at PCMA and all the other conferences, like, I feel for, like, the last three or four years, every time I go to an industry event, we keep talking about, A, having a goal, right, because it helps all of our supplier partners and everyone sitting at the table do the thing we set out we hope to do, but also it means that when we say don't be afraid to take risks and fail fast – around that I love that you're like they're challenging us and we challenge them right back and I mm -hmm. can't think of that answer because I mean that to me is like progress for the event space because there was a time there shortly after the recession because everyone was frightened that they were like no we need to keep it stable and challenging safe. and s yeah safe understated yeah. yeah and so that like it's I get goosebumps even thinking about it now that we can continue to move forward even though it's maybe still not and I kind of have that expectation. I mean, you said kind of an industry show. Like, you expect to see the, the different entertainment. You expect to see the challenges, like the opportunities, because they're testing it out for you. Um, and as the attendee, we need to be a little probably more forgiving. Uh, I was just about to say, it's a double-edged sword. It know. is. Judgy but attendees? What? I mean, you even said, like, planning an event for event people. Oh, God, is, no way. It's hard. And as someone who's done it, like, you know, you get beat up when you're trying something new, but... A lot of those attendees are not willing to try it new. They might not bring in that new entertainment. So you're doing it for them to give it a chance, but who we're evil to each other. Sometimes it feels like um, it's when you try to do too much new mm. at once. Yes. So it's like, we're not going to do just one new thing. We're mm -hmm. going to do three new things. So finding that balance between the safe and then also just communication and, and like yes. setting yeah. expectations and letting it's another one of those balances between yeah. the surprise and the excitement and the finding something new around the corner, um, but also setting expectations. So if you're trying something new, you almost need to warn the audience. It's all about that Just, communication. Yeah, so that, so that they're not surprised by something that flops. Absolutely. Um, whereas if you're honest about it, you know, I'm thinking technology and stuff, because the number of times that I've seen somebody try something brand spanking new that had never been done before are few, and then where it usually goes horribly wrong is when they just didn't tell the audience, hey, just so you know, you know, this is the first time we've ever done this. Yeah. And that if they just would have said that tiny little piece of information, you wouldn't <coughs> have gotten nearly the backlash mm -hmm. of, you know, hey, this is brand new tech and it's bleeding edge and it might work and it might not. Well, but even the way, and I think PCMA has been a real leader there. I was it Chicago or the year before where they split the lunchroom or they tried something just really. Four quadrants, right? You remember? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it failed so It was horrible. It was, was oh, was that MPI? Oh, was it WC? Uh, I'm sorry, MPI. Right. I'm just sitting here. Oh, I thought it was PCMA because I was Chicago. But, but I remember being really surprised by the innovation of the And idea. then they talked about it yeah. later. That's where it was because we were going to a PCMA event and they were talking about it from a case study. The PCMA planners and the MPI planners got up together to talk about how difficult it is to take risks like this because we are so mean girl to each other and we don't mean to do it on purpose, I think. No, no, no. no. But it's like, would you have put that ice sculpture there? Maybe not. 
And then they were like, listen, we know it didn't go well. Here's exactly what we did. So if you ever try this, this is how you could make it better. Mm -hmm. And I love that camaraderie because even within the risk, I don't know that all the communication in the world could have helped them because they did talk a lot about that. And it still didn't work because sometimes even when you communicate with the attendees, like who reads the no before you go email? We want them to. How m angry do we get when our attendees don't read it, right? Oh, right. You're like, so angry. My event. So I don't know. It is tough. So I'm curious uh, as we continue to talk about you know doing doing events here in San Francisco and um, uh, I mean really around the world and around the country, you know, but this is one of the towns that's kind of known a bit for navigating unions. Um, and it's, it's always a touchy thing because, you know, I, I always kind of come from the attitude that, hey, it's the union's job to get the best possible deal for their people. And so you can't really fault people for doing that job, but it definitely can make other people's lives much more difficult from time to time. So, um, again, how do you kind of find that balance either working here in town or, you know, around the country and around the world of, you know, hey, navigating that kind of balance of, uh, you know, getting the best deal and getting the job done? Anyone want to jump on that? <laughs> sure. You know, I like have no like problem with that. I look right at you. I'm like, and you take good night, this everybody. One. Thanks for coming. I have no problem with that. We have multiple false endings on this. Here's show. the reality you come to San Francisco, there's no question it's not a cheap city. It's not inexpensive. You're going to get what you pay for, though. And if you go into the convention center, the hotels, and there is union requirements, you know going, know before you go. Exactly. Right. You know? I think that's, that's the totally biggest thing. Know before you go. Yeah. So, you know, we deal with uh, that a lot with budgeting because a lot, a lot of what we do is producing the entire show, not just putting the entertainment up, but dealing with sound, lights, staging, labor, et cetera. So when we do a budget, you know, there, there's a line in there for union labor. And we have to know the venue. We have to know what it is and, you know, how much it is per hour and what the overtime requirements are and where, where double time comes in and how you deal with breaks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And... If you budget, if you're working with, with, an, with an event professional who understands it, it's really no different than any other city. Mm -hmm. You know, the dollar figure might be a little more. A little more? A little more. It's um, a lot more. I was just thinking coffee. that. Between this and New York City, you're like 300 plus <laughs> plus. For like, that's 12 cups. Really? So, so, so. <laughs> yeah. So go to Starbucks, buy the little <laughs> thing, and bring that's it right. in and quit complaining. <laughs> So I'm going to tell all my attendees that when they come down to the, the meeting space, go just cross the street and then come back, guys. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it is what it is. That's not a union situation, just yeah. so you yeah, understand. Yeah, so clear. Yeah. The no, coffee you, is separate. It's a line it's item. It's a budgetary yeah. reason. Right? It is budgetary, absolutely. But in all seriousness, you know, wh whether the figure is $50 an hour, $75, $100 an hour, whatever that figure is, you're going to put that into your overall budget. And it's going to come in as part of the overall event and you're going to say okay if i want to do an event at moscone center at at&t park at the chase center like they are tonight you got to know what the not only what the union costs are but what the union requirements are do yeah. i need separate people to go on the truck do i need the teamsters in the truck and then local 16 which is iatsi mm -hmm. to to do the work there you know can i have can i have people shadow or is it just straight union you know all of these things that's where people like us come in. You know, we know the rules. We know how to, how to navigate that. And hopefully we are saving you money where we can. Yeah. But we c we're not magicians either. The fact is. It costs money to produce a, like really excellent business events. Even in a non-union pl yeah. place, if you want professionals, they're going to get paid fairly. Yeah. You know, San Francisco, Northern California is not an inexpensive area. And so that, you know, labor here is more expensive than it is in other areas of the country. And so is real estate. And so is, you know, coffee. Um, exactly. It just is what it, it is. is what and it you is. just budget for it. So navigating the unions is no different than here, here than it is in Chicago, New York, or anywhere else. But I think you bring up a very good point about working with local partners. You know, it's one of the reasons why I continue to be a member of the industry associations because, you don't oftentimes on just a regular site visit as you're going out and maybe trying a new city, especially like San Francisco, where there are so many quirks that you really need a native to help you navigate. Like you can come in and say, I need this, but you wouldn't have all those requirements and coming in. So that, that value of the network and the collaboration that we mm -hmm. all have to play together and communicate is, is huge. 
Well, and the union knows the local partners. Right. Mm -hmm. And they know the local vendors. So if you say I'm bringing in such and such sound company and such and such lighting company and such and such staging company, okay. Makes your life easier. Yeah. And those people know how to say, I want this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy from the union. Yeah. Which makes your life they're gonna, yeah, much they're easier. They're going to put together the A crew versus That's the right. B crew. And a lot of that comes in with the attitude that you approach it with. So if you approach it with this adver adversarial attitude of like, oh, I know you're just going to try and screw me over, or da, 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 and instead come, you know, with, you know, hey, you know, let's work together, and you know, you get your bit and I get my bit, you actually will find ways to shave off. That's right. Uh, here and there, like, oh, well, you know. If you bring in that person from the local lighting, you know, rather, you know, getting them through your AV company, but bring them in direct through the union, you know, yes, you're still going to be paying more, but not their overhead plus the union and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, definitely working with it and seeing it as a partnership and how can we make the best of the situation and put on the best show possible as opposed to like, oh, I got it. You know, and the same goes for working with the venues, you know, because if the venue, you know, let's take a Hilton or the Marriott or mm -hmm. one of these places. You know, these people have in-house production companies. Mm -hmm. And if you understand what their situation is, right. you know, sometimes you do have a choice. Well, if you have a choice, okay, let's, you know, let's get three proposals. Let's look at the in-house AV company. Let's look at bringing in from outside to a couple of different companies. Let's see what the differences are and make sure that the person who's putting that together knows how to navigate all of those things in the city. And when you go with the outside company and the in-house team is there, you still have to, you know, have them help you do things, <laughs> and that's crucial. <laughs> yeah, but when it comes to cost, sometimes utilizing both right. is the way to go. I was just in Las Vegas at the Venetian last week doing an event, and, you know, they require you to use their rigging, lighting. That's Brant's favorite hotel. Yeah, well, it's their rigging, it's their lighting, but you can bring in your own sound. Okay, so know how to navigate that, work with them, don't work against them. And, you know, in, in our particular case, we did sound separately because there was very specific needs for the artist we were putting on, and it worked just fine, you know. Um, but it is paramount that you understand or have somebody on your team that understands, again, whether it's San Francisco, New York, or wherever, that understands the venues, the people, or at least knows how to speak the language to get that information out of them. And it, you're talking a lot of experience planners, right, with those pieces, that's what you need. But for those newbies out there, they need to talk to someone who's experienced, use those partners, or um, really plan far in advance. The further they plan in advance, the more they'll be able to figure out their budgetary lines, yeah. figure out those nuances that they're not aware of, get those multiple bids to see really where the fiscal savings are. Because I do think a lot of people kind of shotgun events here. You know, it's being such a high in corporate world, they just kind of shotgun them in. But we're usually experienced people doing it. And if you're not, you get dinged with all those feeds, and then the bad rub is where it comes in. So, well, pre planning. Uh, a, pre planning, B, work building a new team, a good team, mm -hmm. and C, don't be adversarial. As yeah. Brent said, you know, as soon as you're adversarial, it goes all the way through the right. event, you know, and you're fighting, and you're fighting, and you just don't want to. And the no before you go. So it's one thing if you are a rookie, but I've also seen people who've been putting on events for 15 years walking into Vegas and going, why is it so expensive here? It's like, right. uh, how did you not do a modicum of research before you decided right. to come, you know, come to the show? And it's, Well, it's, when they were sitting know. in their office in Antarctica, they just didn't right. think yeah, ahead, yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then, but it also brings up a, a, an important point of that we, as, as the professionals in, in the business, being able to explain that to stakeholders. So when the, st when the stakeholders who don't, things yeah. say you know you know what we've been in Orlando for a few years now let's go someplace else what about Vegas it's then the opportunity for the planners either the internal planners or the external planners to speak up and just say great town we do amazing events there we can do some incredible things and some you know people have a blast and you know but you need to know it's going to be a lot more expensive than it is you know that show that we did in Orlando last year or if you need to keep the budget the same amount, you're just not going to be able to do the same level of production that we did because of X, Y, and Z. And that's where I think people really get frustrated as <coughs> attendees is that they're rolling from, you know, especially events that bounce around the country right. or around the world again. You know, they then go, well, wh where's the rest of it? You know, because they've had to move into just a different country. I mean, things cost different in different cities, so it's, just, it's thinking this stuff through just a, a little bit before you roll. And sometimes you're cutting 
like you said, if you're keeping the budget line the same, but you're paying for those union costs that you didn't know you had a plan for, you now know it, so you're cutting breakfast, and your attendees have been getting breakfast forever. or With protein and coffee and extra right. carbs and fruit, and then now That's you're like, cutting Cut the coffee. <laughs> It's all about that coffee. Cut the coffee. But then they're cutting entertainment or something like that, which is Do we need to pay our experience. speakers? I mean, let's be real here. Right. All of those conversations <laughs> happen, and that's just part of the, the knowledge of the sexy name of San Francisco because, right. I mean, some people are probably here for PCMA because of the city. Let's be honest. Of Absolutely. Course. Right? And I mean, uh, that's... And they was, should be. Well, it's yeah. a beautiful city. It's well, a wonderful it's a city. Bridge. And I was talking to someone. She's like, well, why didn't they just take it to Sacramento? It could have gone so much further. And I was like... I'm not sure how we answer that without making a face because Sacramento is amazing and it's really great in a lot of ways. They have a beautiful convention center, excellent hotels, but they don't have the water and the bridge and the energy. There's This is like New York City. There's just a lot of energy here, but you pay a premium where we sit for said energy. Exactly, exactly. But it's I a beautiful been, premium. Yeah, definitely been venues that I've gone to. I won't call them out where it's like, this is an amazing place. It's an amazing venue. I would love to come here. It's an hour away from the airport. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like I, I I would have a hard time recommending that place because it's just as as experience of just getting there is painful. Um, doesn't matter how gorgeous it is after a certain point, unless that's the point, right? right. To, to we're going to get away, we're going to disconnect, we're going to get out of the city, you know, that kind of thing. But if it's just a standard convention, you know, that's hard to justify sometimes. But again, that's one of the things else about San Francisco and really the Northern California area. Like if this isn't the right speed or size or you can't find the right venue san jose san clarita have just amazing teams you can go up to napa and sonoma it's just like no matter what there's a fit somehow for the culture of you and your events well and again especially with smaller events yeah. you know and if they're incentive trips you know yes. that's where the napas and yes. the sonomas and the lake tahoe's and half moon bay yeah all come in and the food Oh my of God, course, the food. food. I mean, San Francisco is a foodie oh, city. God, you know, it's foodie paradise. Food. But you know, the thing is that that's where, again, a good DMC right. comes in. Yes. You know, that can help you move and navigate through all of that and work with their partners. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, PCMA is a great example of what uh, the different DMCs are doing. You know, we're working with a few of them throughout this week on many different things. And they are knocking it out of the park. Like every event we've attended has just there's not you we can't find something to judge which is really difficult with my group of friends They're, we're all super judgy we own it and we have t-shirts so and it's just like oh my god did you wow let's do that and you and just yeah see i'm speechless it never happens so after layering on the butter um uh, you know let's uh, ask I, I feel like i'm being the negative nelly over here but i'll take it um you know just recently there's uh, an article being an, an announcement that uh it was oracle i think is pulling their major convention from san francisco and one yeah. of the reasons that they're, they're citing safety concerns mm -hmm. but one of the main reasons is the significant homeless population uh that is here um i think it's an interesting point um, when you start to, you know, m every city kind of has their, their issues, obviously. Um, and many metropolitan cities have homeless problems. Um, uh, so I'm curious to just get your take a little bit on, on what happens when you start hearing about major uh, conventions being pulled from a city because of something like that. To a certain extent, Chicago had to go with it because of unions. You know, they're like, hey, we, people just started pulling their events out of Chicago and they had to kind of have a, hey, let's get together guys and figure this out or otherwise none of us are gonna work. Do you think there's something like that heading San Francisco's way of, you know, hey, we, we gotta figure this out or we're gonna start losing more business? Or is this a fluke? I'm curious to hear your opinion being a local because I also think the communication for a city to communicate to their local people living there is one thing and how they communicate it to the external is a different thing. It should be the same message um, so do you hear anything on a local level about it? Do you hear it in your news? Do you hear the conversations about it? You know, honestly, no. Um, other than, you know, there's no question. We have, a, we have a lot of homeless here, and we have a homeless issue, and the city is doing its best to work with them. Many of the local uh, companies, Salesforce, Oracle, you know, many of the companies are throwing money at it. Uh, Mark Benioff from Salesforce actually was a was a, a, a big push in that take 1% of your profit and put it back into uh, 
fundraising for charities. And it showed at Dreamforce this year. That was actually one of their initiatives that they did. They were saying, we recognize there's a homeless problem here, but as event attendees and as a headquartered here, we're doing our part by mm -hmm. food donations, working with the local pantry, working with some of the shelters, but we can't do it alone. That's so right. they made the events and hospitality an ally, which was one of the first times I'd seen a major brand take that step. Well, even, you know, when you talk about Dreamforce, you know, the big concert they do this year, they had Fleetwood Mac. That's a fundraiser for the hospital. Right. And, you know, for the children's hospital. And so it's the giving back, which is really what this city does. And, you know, the fact that Oracle is moving, it obviously is a city we're sorry to see it go. There's no question. Um, you know, both from just a historical point of it being born and raised and lived here for so many years and from a financial perspective it is a big loss for the city right. um, but the city I think recognizes it they know that whatever the issue is and I can honestly say I don't really know what the final you know what the inner workings were you know there's always what is said to the public but really what happened behind closed doors might be a completely right. different story so I don't know you know I was not privy to all of that but I do know that, yes, we're losing it, and yes, Las Vegas will get it, and good for them, bad for us, and we hope that one day it'll come back. Right. You know? And in the meantime, we've got this big, beautiful convention center that's going to pull other things that people are going to go, hey, now that space is available in San Francisco. We can take advantage of it. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not going to sit dormant. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think as an attendee, the conference did a really great job. I don't know if you all got the no card in your hotel room, you, your no, uh, Airbnb. I didn't, but I've yeah. seen them. They had them. Were shown around they had them, and it was fantastic. It addressed it. It gave you your tips on what to do. The numbers. It showed a map on how to get to the center from where you were at. So they addressed it, and I think that's kind of a West Coast city thing, anyway, right? Like you kind of hit down, and they all have the houseless problem, and it's something that every city is aware of. You know that going into the city, you have to educate your attendees. It, there's eight million reasons why conferences leave cities, right? Right, and this is one of reasons why people would leave a city, and it is unfortunate. But you're right; it's it still a good. sexy city. Yeah. Someone's gonna come and fill that space. Someone will fill that space, and, and I'm sure Oracle's attendees at some point will be like, "Remember when we used to go get dim sum in Chinatown, and yes. now we can't get that here?" And you know, they might come back. You never know. I, it, well, but yes, it is. But you walk in your numbers, and you educate your attendees on how to handle that. And the fact of the matter is, you know, there's certain people that are going to go, Oracle's in Vegas, another convention in Vegas. <laughs> We're not We in actually do really like you, Vegas. You we know? know we pick on you a hey, lot. I love Vegas. Yeah. I'm there all the time I doing know. events. But, you know, listen, whether it's Vegas or Orlando right. or wherever, you know, there are certain cities that get the major yeah, conventions. they've got you the know. space to do it. Yeah. They've got the space. They've got the climate. Right. You know, and... They've got uh, the good airport lift. I mean, yeah. So, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, there's a reason the homeless go to the cities they're going to because climate-wise they're friendly. Well, again, there's 8 million reasons to go to a city. There's 8 million reasons not to go. Exactly. And I think... Bringing back for PCMA, Jamie Murdoch, when he was on during our hackathons episode earlier this year, he ran the hackathon again during PCMA a couple days ago. One of their challenges and the benefits from that was focused on the homeless population just because that's been a cause of helping support, you know, ending that through PCMA. And again, it was something where once they finished it, they came out because – for people who aren't as familiar with San Francisco, the convention center and a lot of the major hotels butt right up against the Tenderloin, mm -hmm. which is one of the highest poverty, if not the highest poverty uh, section of the, mm -hmm. the city. And so it can be very dangerous sometimes if you walk out of the wrong door of the Hilton. Mm -hmm. And not for anybody's lack of trying, but I love that as an industry, we continue to highlight how important it is for an attendee safety, but how we can be helpers instead of that, and that the city's really taking a focus and continuing that dialogue and keeping attendees safe as well. Well, the city strives for that. Right. You know, that's a big deal. Um, several years ago when Willie Brown was the mayor, I mean, he brought so many things forward of how, you know, how to do it and what we need to do, and the progress that's been made over the last 20 years is absolutely amazing. Yeah. And, you know, even today they're still, okay, what else can we do, what else can we do, what else can we do? So, you know, it's, I'm pretty proud of what they've done with this city. So thinking about PCMA from a first-timer's perspective, what kind of advice would you give 
uh, to a first timer coming to PCMA or for visiting San Francisco for the first time? We'll, we'll, we'll just throw that out there for both of you. It's funny, I've met a lot of first timers. I mean, I knew you before. I didn't know this was your first time at PCMA. Um, but I've sat next to a lot of first timers. And it's that common industry phrase when you hear at any industry show they're overwhelmed. Um, and so that's where you have to step back, take a bite of w the programming, figure out your map, figure out your journey figure out your why, your goals, and what you want to accomplish. You know, some of them come in without a plan, and you're like, you can't come into these without a plan. You just can't, because there's so much content um, in all the different areas of the center, in every corner, and, you know, research a city, figure out which dim sum place you want to eat at, because you're going to be overwhelmed, but you now want... I really want dim sum. I'm having it for dinner. Maybe that's why I'm, like, so <laughs> focused on it. I, like, can't get it out of my head. But I think you need to come in with a plan, and that's kind of any industry show but it, a lot of people are really attainable here you know there are some high profile people walking around that you can network with that you can just not be embarrassed to have that conversation with like this is a very approachable event um and it though people are overwhelmed by it i think the best piece of advice is to take a step back figure out your why figure out your plan and then don't be afraid to have those conversations do you, did you, should I have given you that advice before you Yeah, that would have been great. Thanks. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's a little late. A little late. So sorry. I'm, I'm curious to know, so at this show, how much of an issue has there been with white space? So to give you that moment of, uh, you know, having that time to yourself uh, as opposed to, you know, just figure it out on your own and you're packed from the moment you go in from, you know, that point on. I mean, I think this year, looking at the schedule, they've been more deliberate about the breaks. I was, so I have one of my staff here, and this is Meta's first time at it. And it was really interesting, and they've been more deliberate with the lounges, too. Like, the Visit Orlando has the O-Town Lounge, and there's the Mindfulness Lounge that does yoga. Steelcase has brought their workspace. Like, they've really gotten towards a better balance of knowing that you're out of the office and you need to, like, sit down and either decompress and answer emails as well as the 10 content. And they, they aren't stacking them as hard and as fast. Even with the lounge and the lunch experience and the time to explore the exhibit hall, they've kind of rebranded that approach. And so you really have time to go in and actually talk to the exhibitors and sponsors. And that, that I feel like that has felt like a shift. I saw the 45 minute break. And I when I saw it on the schedule, I was like, well, they don't need that, right? We don't need that long of a break. But I can tell you, when you leave that general session and you hit the wall of people and you can't walk anywhere, right. that was hard. And that took up 10 minutes right there. So the 45 minutes make sense once you kind of navigate through all the partner booths and you. And the size of the space. Yeah, it's just, it was hard to navigate through all those people. So when you come out of the main hall, it's just, it's a wall and you need that extra time. Um, I think it depends on how many people you know too yeah. in the white space hey uh hey. exactly because hey. all of a sudden <laughs> sessions are starting and you're right. not in them because yep. you just knocked Keep into 10 50 people. people and it you know i was with some people on the opening night reception and they made it a game they were going to drink every time someone stopped angie <laughs> <laughs> and they were having a great time with it and i was kind of like guys this isn't funny like i need to like take a step back and just have like yeah, when do i get to drink right <laughs> right um so in that kind of area but that's another reason why you're here you're here to right. see everyone yeah. but do yeah. you get the time by yourself i haven't found it yet it's when i'm escaping to my room and people are questioning why i'm not going to an event it's because i'm like i need to shut down for two seconds well, but there have been breaks built in and i think the evening events there's been again it felt like even though there's all of the supplier events and everything that goes on in the evening there's been a greater opportunity for white space if you chose to skip the supplier events mm -hmm. before you had to be at like the evening event. And that's been really nice because if you needed the break in the afternoon you, and you didn't get it, you could catch up before you had to go eat mm -hmm. and then still get up. And they haven't been starting everything like at the crack of dawn. You know, if you want to make the general session, great, but they're live streaming it. And so you can kind of maybe not get up until 10 o'clock if you needed the time to find yourself and not be around the wall. Being a mother of four, when's the last time you got up at 10 o'clock? Oh, very long time. <laughs> and, and I'm on East Coast time right now. Oh so I, that was my thing. As an East Coaster, though, I'm like done by nine. I'm like, can y'all start the day? Word. Because 
I mean, I've been up for hours and I'm hungry for lunch. In general, session hasn't even happened yet. So I do think you have to think coffee. about that time. Coffee, three hundred dollar coffee. Starbucks, three hundred plus <laughs> plus. The plus 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 plus. Mm-hmm. I, but I do think you need to think about that in yeah, your programming. No, I, absolutely agree. I would be interested to see their attendance. Like, what's the majority of the Midwest East Coast versus West Coast, and are they calculating their programming around that? I I don't know what their percentages are. And the Europeans, because there's a very large right. chapter that's come in from the UK, and I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, how are you doing it? And I just because you wouldn't yeah. have enough time to reset in two and a half days at all. No, well, I well, hopefully they come in early and be able to see the, the city. Change yeah, see the city and buy some coffee. There were two presenters from Berlin, and they said they got in the day before. And they were in this presentation. I was like, y'all are probably jet lagged yeah. like a beast. But I mean, they killed it. They did a great job. Um, but I just think that's something to consider in all the coffee that just keeps us going. Absolutely. I've never had a conference without coffee. I just you I've don't. never had one. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it brings up a fantastic question of, again, it's something we've talked about on this show so many times and we've touched on even a few times yet today of just that knowing your audience. Yes. Um, uh, Hopefully somebody's got those numbers, right? So somebody's got those numbers and knowing we've got people coming from majority seem to be still coming from the East Coast. So planning your schedule according to that, that's not something I get I hear talked about very often is talking about the timing based on where your attendees are coming from. That's interesting because I always think about it. Well, and I, I think, too, this is your AV side is showing because you get a group of event planners together like – we talk about that a l- all of us talk about that a lot because especially unless you're time zone neutral because you've been traveling so hard it's always a very specific way when you're setting the program and booking the space even because like do you need the yoga class or are they all going to sleep in because everybody's coming from portland right and then you have you know if you're waking up at 3 a.m which i'm sure you're three or four right mm-hmm. um we've already worked out before you even thought about getting up right like, we're good. We've had our eight cups of coffee before 7 a.m. You know, like, it's one of now those Now we things. need the pastry and, like, second breakfast. And I'm wondering if that's impacting the breakfast that they have. Like, I'm wondering if that's lower or higher. Well, the CMP breakfast this morning wasn't as well attended as I thought it, it was going to be. And I was like, that's interesting because usually it's a packed house. So well, I wonder what if went on last night. Something. Well, that's true. They had the Visit Indie comic thing until, like, 1 a.m. or something. So that may be it. But that I usually... Mean, you've got to keep that perspective of the person that stays out till 1 a.m. is not going to be the person there at 7 in the morning. But I also think location has something to do with yeah, that. Yeah, Because they put it at the Hilton. Yeah. And how many of the CMPs are at the Hilton? Yeah, that's That true. would also be something good to note, like, your attendee-wise, because I'm going to be... I didn't go this morning. Because I was not able to trek it to the Hilton by myself at 7 o'clock in the morning when it's butted up to Tenderloin. Like, all the things, right? Mm-hmm. And I wasn't going to try You didn't want to leave your suite at the Four Seasons is what you're telling us? I love that hotel so much. You're so <laughs> sweet. So sweet. But it's just something to consider. But that's knowing your attendees. Like, yeah. maybe it would be advantageous to see who the CMPs are at a property and then put the CMP breakfast there. Um, but then again, it's an open block. We can kind of do whatever we want. So. But, you know, the other interesting thing, and I'm not attending PCMA, but we've provided a lot of entertainment for this. Um, we had enter- entertainment this morning on the general session, and the person from my office says, you know, I was there at 5.30 in mm-hmm. the morning, and we were, you know, rehearsing at 6.15, and I don't know what time it started, but it was early. Yeah. And mm-hmm. last Nine night, a. I had an event at the Nico Hotel, yeah. 6 to 8 p.m. So it was, you know, it was a karaoke night. We provided a, a band that I did I saw karaoke. photos of it. It looked great. Yeah. I, <laughs> it looked uh, so good. They <laughs> called me and said it was wonderful. Yeah. And, it uh, looked great. I was watching so, the videos. So, you know, but the, the, the point is, it was early in the evening. It was not a late night thing. Now, I'm sure if there was a comedy well, thing party one with in the, the morning. purpose was like 8 to 11, and then, huh? 10, 8 to 10. We've got Alex in the back because he knows all the schedules, y'all. He's and a computer. He is. It's great. And then, I, I think the thing with Visit Indie didn't even. That was late. Yeah, yeah, it started after party with purpose. So yeah, it must have been hardcore o'clock. though, because if it ended at ten, there were people who were definitely still hurting from that party. Well, this someone morning. was who was it? Oh, it was Visit Phoenix did a party bus, and it literally started at four thirty and ran through the Visit Indy. Wow, it, and like Go you Phoenix. could like get on and off, and I was like all the major event things, and then that was like running up against Cadmium's dim sum dumpling crawl. <laughs> Which I was How like, did I, miss that? I was like, I I got myself invited to the party because so yes, I was. It was a, it's just like, but like that's like that fascinating, like taking advantage of the city. 
oh, what a great way to showcase it. And then party on Phoenix for like really having, you know, don't get into the Uber here. Just stay with us and you're with your people and you're safe and you have the things and leave when you want. I love that. Taking advantage of what the city has to offer. I love Which it. is very smart. Yeah. So smart. I think that's probably actually a great place to kind of leave this discussion. Is there anything else that you guys want to throw out? We usually end the show with a, uh, uh, you know, what's your one tip uh, for planners out there? We can certainly go in that direction unless we want to mix it up a little bit while we're on site. Um, but uh, that's probably a good place to, for us to do it. So what do you, if you could do one tip for planners out there, Angie, what do you think you would throw out there? Network. I mean, we're a community. I mean, don't we all love the industry because of the people we work with, Absolutely. right? So Absolutely. I would say just keep those relationships alive. You book business, you book entertainment because of relationships. You book hotels because of it. Just keep strengthening that network that you have. I couldn't I, – that, 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 I've been asked what is your biggest professional regret, and my biggest professional regret is that I didn't start networking earlier in my mm -hmm. career. So I – I, I thank you for putting that out there because I think that's a really important one that sometimes people forget about. And I think some of us really hate to do it. It's yeah. hard. It Networking is. It takes hard. work. Especially this industry because we can be kind of tribal and like if you're not on the in crowd, like breaking in, but all it takes is one conversation. And I think that's something where we will let you in it, and you'll all speak the ship. Well, if you wouldn't be here if you weren't part of us. And so. Absolutely. Community, just keep letting it thrive. So yeah. that's it. Networking. All right. Next up. You know, I say this, I don't know how many times a year. <laughs> Just be honest. Keep your nose clean. If there's an issue, bring it up. Yeah. Take it head on. Don't try to uh, brush it under the carpet. We're in an industry where no one's going to get hurt. No blood's going to be shed. There's going to be problems. The food's not going to be on time. The sound system might go out. These are all reality of the business. Take it head on. Be honest. Tell your client. Tell your partners. Tell your staff what's going on and when you have an issue just take it head on and everything's going to be fine and it's a lot better easier way to go through life i love that because they actually had a session talking about failure and knowing that like there's always a backup plan and even if the backup plan doesn't work somebody else out there has failed bigger than you have that's right so this is that place to do that inside this community mm -hmm. so that's absolutely wonderful. And we wanted to do one shout out. We are filming from a beautiful, beautiful customer service oriented company called Zendesk. We're going to have their head of global events, Sarah Reed, on in a few weeks to talk about how they run their user conference and many different things about how attendee experience and customer service walk hand in hand. And so we're so thankful that they gave us the time. And our guests, you guys have been absolutely fabulous. Thank you Thank for you. taking some time away from your busy schedule at the conference and here in town while producing all of these events. We loved really hearing your stories today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks that for happens. having me. All right. So where before we head out, where can folks find out more about you? Or do they want to find out, connect, uh, connect with you? Yeah. I almost started to talk about connect. I know. I, I, <laughs> I was like, where's he going for just with a that? It's but I meant, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so, so find out more about you and what you're up to these days. Yeah. So um, I'm now the vice president of operations for LeaderCast. So we produce the world's largest one day leadership conference. Um, LeaderCast.com. I'm on there. Find me. I'm on all the platforms. Name them. Pretty simple, Angie Aarons. So I would love to connect. No pun intended. Yes. For anybody that doesn't know, she used to work for Connect yeah, for a sorry. long time, and yeah. yes, it's yeah. no longer. Does so you it. can connect with her. Yeah. There you go. So uh, my company is Innovative Entertainment. InnovativeEntertainment.com is our uh, website, and we're here in San Francisco as well as Los Angeles, San Diego, and New York. And uh, we, you know, we're booking speakers and talent and general session entertainment and major uh, celebrities down to local DJs and, you know, handle all the production. So we, we pretty much do it all over the world, and uh, we're available to everybody. We want to connect. There you go. There you go. We all want to. We all just want to connect. That's right. <laughs> Lindsay, let's take it home. What do you think? Do I have to do the closing? I You're so much better at it because I say hyphen instead of dash, and it throws me off every time. <laughs> Sorry. Well, thank you for joining me as host, the hostess with the mostest, y'all. Uh, here on Event Icons. So folks, uh, just a reminder, Event Icons is usually live, 5 p.m. Eastern, 
wherever your finest podcasts are found. We can find it more at event-icons.com um, or event-icons.com, whichever you'd prefer. Or just do um, hashtag event icons right. hashtag and tweet it. us. Hashtag event icons is uh, where we want it, where we can, we're on all the socials. So please do let us know uh, what you think of the show. Um, what is your uh, biggest challenges when you try to choose a city and a venue? Um, you know, do, are you doing the research? Uh, have you been surprised? If so, by what? Um, and uh, what are your favorite things about San Francisco, whether it's dim sum or a unique raw locations? Did you find coffee that costs less than 300 plus plus? If so, please, please tweet at Angie yes. and I. Go right. to any good coffee shop. There you go. There you go. So go to the website, though, event-icons.com. There you're going to find all the transcripts, all of the uh, stories, all of the links that we talked to about the various things on the show. Um, you're going to find the transcripts. Uh, you're going to find the links to all of the podcasts uh, apps that are out there, whether that's Google Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Cast, my personal favorite. Um, still not a paid spokesperson for them, but we're working on that. Um, so do let us know, though, if, we're, if there is a platform that we're not on and you want to have a us be on. We want to be wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, in the meantime, we'll hopefully see you all soon and see you next time on Event Icons. <coughs> Bye. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch all the bonus content, resources mentioned, and an invite to our Facebook and LinkedIn groups, head to www.event-icons.com. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway. Just tag your post with Hashtag Event Icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on Hashtag Event Icons. Icons.